All right, first off, I say we're going to dedicate this episode to answering some questions. And to be honest with you, this, one of the questions that came in, some, a subject matter I've never really heard of before, and I find that it's um, it's very compelling. It boggled my mind. So I guess you could say the two questions that we're going to look at today, one of them focuses on um, a large number of people who are missing from our national parks all across the nation, up into Canada. When you look at the number of missing people in general from the United States, and you compare it per capita, so to speak, to the visitors that go to our national parks, it's off the chain. Now, there's some environmental issues we'll discuss, but you can factor all that out. There's something here. The other one uh, question was more on do woods, like forests, uh, tend to have – do they have – uh, hold special power or could evil entities have more power in the woods or in a forest than let's say out here in an urban environment where we are now or is there more like activity overall more yeah more areas? demonic or more satanic activity whatever you want to call it in 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 the woods does it, is there anything there to that um and and I think both of these questions kind of go hand in hand with each other yeah. You know, so I thought we'll just go ahead and tackle these now. Now, that being said, you know, we're wanting this to be a viewer driven show. And to be honest with you, on the national park issue, uh, we are going to probably need to have more than one episode to really cover. Uh, and, and you'll see why when we start unpacking that one. So. Mel's hole may have to wait. We've been talking about Mel's yeah, hole. We're just going to keep teasing that for like a year. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so you're going to start off, I guess you could say, with um, the first question is the correlation between woods, forest, and the working of evil spirits. That's kind of how that question came in. Have you ever pondered that question yourself? Well, I've always just kind of generally pondered what about the different physical spaces that demons are typically found in, i.e., abandoned homes, you know, uh, spooky looking factories and warehouses and big, large buildings that are dark. And the woods especially is like a recurring thing that I've seen. It just seems like they find the spookiest places. And I guess that is exactly why we consider them spooky is because it's this, there's this general feeling that something is hiding in the trees, in the dark, in those weird spaces. And I think the woods especially is just this large, vast, unpopulated area where we don't really know what's going on. I mean, in a city, you can walk by and see into an alleyway. You can see into windows. There's not a whole lot of places to hide there, but out in the wilderness, there's miles and miles and miles of just completely un... I say uncharted. It's charted, but we don't know what's going on in there. In the woods, uh, more unknown in forest areas is what you're kind of saying than what yeah. you kind of have in your... Because you are you don't live in a forest. You don't live in a... Yeah, well, just because we know generally what the lay of the land is, we've got topographical maps. Like, we kind of generally understand the woods now better than we used to. Um, now, the ocean's a whole different story. But the woods, we kind of understand them, but that doesn't mean we always see what's going on in there because there's so much of it, especially like jungles and these huge forests. They're just massive areas of space where, yeah, we know what's there, but until you go in there and you explore that, no telling what kind of stuff goes on. Exactly. So this question here, never never really considered it so i thought first we'll try to look at scripture to see if we can find anything maybe look at some extra biblical books to see if we can find anything pointing to that and then we'll just come at it from more of a, a data point logical angle and probably what's going to happen is we're going to do a combination of both yeah but woods forests deserts uh in scripture uh when they're mentioned, they all have some type of imagery associated with them. So when you think of, you know, when you hear of woods, then uh, there's not a lot of mention of woods, forests, deserts, and that sort of thing, but there's a few. So what we have to look at is what does that imagery mean? So the imagery for forest, uh, one of the better um, examples for woods and forests because uh, it's different than a wilderness like a, a desert, would come out of uh, Isaiah twenty nine seventeen, And it alludes to the fact, it says that uh, forests uh, are imagery for uncultivated, unfruitful, uh, no growth 
per se, like that's going to sustain your life. Like where a garden or a or an orchard is there to produce fruit, to produce life. And so it, it definitely in Isaiah, he contrasts woods to be a place of unfruitfulness. All right, so some theologians have surmised based on that that you could say, you know, the, you know, in Galatians chapter 5, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit, but before yeah. it talks about the fruit of the Spirit, it gives you the anti-fruit of the Spirit, things that are born out of unfruitful, it's kind of evil. And so they kind of equate that evil, that those, those things that are in, in Galatians chapter 5 uh, could point to the unfruitfulness, that, that kind of stuff could have more power and take place more in a wooded area than in a than in an urban environment it's plausible i don't see the connection there uh, i'm neutral on that so this is what i want us to i want us to look at some data points on this and we're going to utilize uh some supernatural some theological point of view but we're just going to look at data points and then we're going to try to draw a conclusion if woods can be a place where evil can have more power per se. And we'll just lay it out and you can decide for yourself and the viewers can decide for themselves. Uh, What I find interesting is one story from scripture uh, that mentions the word woods found in uh, 2 Kings chapter 2. Have you ever heard the story of Elisha, not Elijah, but you know how Elijah goes to heaven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Elisha uh, is being made fun of by a group of young men. And, and, and I actually don't know this story so okay. far. Okay, so Second Kings chapter two, the very beginning of 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 Second Kings chapter two, you have Elijah and Elisha walking. They're just kind of cruising along, walking, and then. God decides to bring Elijah home, so he gets taken to heaven in a whirlwind. You know, Enoch was walking with God, and he was no more, so somehow he went to heaven, didn't die a natural death. Elijah is the same way. He's another person who never died. He's just walking along, talking to his— Elijah or Elisha? Elijah. Okay. Elijah's walking along with his mentor. It's a mentor. You know, he's mentoring Elijah to take over the— office of prophet for for israel and all of a sudden this whirlwind just boom now he's gone pulls him up pulls him up all right so then as you read on in that in that chapter uh you find that as elijah is walking this group of men i'll read the verses in just a second i just want to give you the narrative this group of young men, and it's the debate, is it teenagers, is it young men? I think it's people who are probably around 15 to 20 years old. There's a large group of them start making fun, and they start disrespecting Elijah as he's walking. And uh, I guess you could say they were body shaming him. So, see, I know some woke words. All right, so so just there you know. So just so you know. First century body shaming. <laughs> First century. It was before that, man. It's like in the B.C. Oh, body. crap, you're right. This is all, yeah, BC, wow. Okay, just BC kidding. My bad. Body sh- I just wanted to throw that in there so you, so you can see that I do, you know, I do That's some have, BCBS, body shaming. <laughs> I do know a little bit about that. So anyway, <laughs> let me read you what's going on here. It says 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 23 and 24. He went. He that's Elijah went up from Be- uh, went up there to Bethel, and while he was going up that way, some some boys came out of the city and jeered him, saying, "Go up, you bald head! Go up, you bald head!" So their body shaming his baldness, and uh, he turned around, and when he saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. And two she bears came out of the woods and killed forty two men. <laughs> Holy crap! Uh, how do I know? How do I not know that story? They don't teach that in Sunday school. <laughs> they should. That's awesome. I mean, it's not. I mean, it's awesome. But it. it wow. Okay. Yeah. So that's clearly a spiritual act, if you ask me. That's a striking of the Lord. Sounds like. Well, I mean, what yeah, do you think? And, and there's a lot of imagery there that if you disrespect God, bad things are going to happen. If you disrespect God's men who are truly called, bad things are going to happen. If you disrespect nature, bad things are going to happen. And God can use. Anything that he created to fulfill his mission. And that's sure. what you see here. Um, you see woods. All right. So the word woods that we're, that we're used to talking about here in America, a wooded area, she bears. 
you see that um, their animals were called out of the woods. Now they're not spirits, you know. It's not they're not sp- possessed by the Holy Spirit or something like that. Because no, they're not. Well, well, you know, we're going to talk about that. But there were okay. two animals. They're not spirits per se. Came out of the woods and fulfilled God's will. Now there is a spiritual component there, because odds are the bears wouldn't have come out of the woods just because. Well, for sure they were they were uh, inspired <laughs> to yes. an extreme degree to kill forty something people. That's 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 not a natural occurrence. No, 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 like. no, no, not at all. So you could say it'd be safe to say right here. I have it written here, just so I make sure I get it out there. You could say it's safe to say. I'm going to ask you this because it's a data point that the spirit of God calls the bears to act. Mm. Yep. Okay, so that's a data point. I want you to. We're gonna we call it connecting dots. But when I say connecting dots from an investigative standpoint, we're not actually sitting there connecting dots. We're connecting data points. Yeah, so, I like that. I all like right, that. so there's one data point. I want you to just keep there. We're gonna see. If, I'm gonna see if we're gonna connect them the way. And and, I, and when we're and when I complete this, tell me those don't make. A, that's not connecting. Those don't that, connect. That's yeah. fine. Okay, so. Um. God's spirit calls these bears to act and kill these people. We, we, we agree with that, correct? Yeah. All right. And we know that God and evil spirits exist. You have God's spirit. You have the Holy Spirit. You have angels that did not fall, that are still uh, doing the work. Uh, like Psalms 91 says, uh, I will send my ministering and my protective angels to be about you. Right, so we know that we have angels that have different jobs. They're out there, and we know that the same is true. We've spent time unpacking that in previous episodes. That the Bain Elohim that fell, they all have Satan and his evil spirits of all different types have jobs to do as well. It's just working against God. It's that whole seed DNA thing. So we know that they're working. So remember when we talked about Satan's always counterfeiting? Yeah. He's always out there to counterfeit and to try to try to mimic what God does. So we know that he he's doing he can do the same thing. He will use um, creatures from the woods to accomplish his mission, or he will use spirits from the woods to accomplish his mission. Satan's just as we see God doing it here in Second Kings. Now stay with me as we connect these data. Well, I'm with you because I was going to ask that question. I'm glad I didn't because you're getting right into it about when you said God called these animals in some way that may be unclear to, to act on that. My immediate question was, well, can Satan and demons do that? So yeah. here we go. So here we go. So the, here's the second data point. Um, I think it's second. I'm going to go ahead and make a note just to make sure. Um, demonology, people who study, and, and, and I don't recommend people to go out and do this. If you're going to go out and study, if you're going to spend 30 minutes studying demonology, you need to spend an hour studying Scripture. Don't, and angels too. And I mean, angels. So. You're gonna talk about the the fallen angels. Talk about the the ones that are still yeah, doing God's but will. But double it. Yeah, but, but double it or more because because what we take in, even though we're believers, is important. Um, so just remember that. So some fallen angels can affect your dreams. Now some uh, people uh, who have studied this in depth uh, say that that's demon mare who uh, will we get the word nightmare from, Ooh. who inserts into the brain and uh, causes night terrors. Now, there are also the demons incubus and succubus. They're the ones that go into the brain and give erotic dreams. So you have terror dreams and you have erotic dreams from the evil side, pretty much mapped out through through history that the, this is this is kind of factual. Some demons have control over the weather when God allows them to. Some demons have control over animals when God allows them to. Some have the ability to control your mind. Some have the ability to possess you. Uh, Some demons uh, work better in rural environments, while others work better in big city settings. So it would be safe to say some demons work better in the woods. And some demons work better in a, in, a, in a city that's established. So basically, evidence indicates in the study of demons, it's called demonology, uh, that fallen angels, the Bain Elohim, have the expertise in different areas. They have different jobs, and they work better in certain environments. 
So that's just kind of how it works. And I would say that the same is true for God's angels. They have different jobs. They can work better, and they have different missions, and they work better in different environments. It's just the way God created it. So is that data point making sense? Definitely. All yeah. right, so let's keep connecting some data points. I think we're going to be on data point number three. All right, several factors, I believe, come into our uh, as us as humans when we start thinking about the woods, and you hit on it uh, earlier as we were talking about this, and this is from like a psychological standpoint, and it's also from the data that's been put into our hard drive since we were little kids, Hansel and Gretel, uh, the uh, wolf that goes after the little girl in the cape, Little Red Riding Hood. You know, they're always in the woods. Robin Hood, Little Red Riding Hood. Little Riding Hood, Little Red Riding Hood, not Little Red Robin Hood. Little Red okay. Riding Hood. I'm getting, I'm getting the fairy tales mixed up. Right, so, <laughs> so you got the girl in the cape, it's in the woods. Girl in the cape. And then you got Hansel and Gretel with the witch. They're in the woods. And a lot of times when you see uh, for, for, for children's stories, uh, scary things happen in the woods. So when you're a child and you're taking in your data points, what's going into your mind? Subconsciously. Yeah, fear. That is going to be a place that strikes fear. What does Satan like to use? He loves to use fear. Mm -hmm. So woods already have into us struck into us fear there's unknowns in there you don't live in well i mean maybe you live in the woods but you know you don't live in the woods by nature we're not we're not feral humans i mean there probably are some feral humans out there living in the woods uh, but but we're not feral humans so that's not part of our we don't we're something we're not really familiar with yeah. so when we're not familiar with something we try to integrate our civilization with the woods but not completely just go into the woods and live there. And, we, and we be try there to, forever. We, yeah, we integrate that. So, yeah. yeah, I've got woods in my backyard, but also removed like 12 trees when I moved in because they were like right on my house. So it was just too right. much. We tend to <laughs> yeah. think woods are dangerous. Yeah, yeah. And on like a very basic, like, I mean, I think the reason it's been, it's persisted as a theme, even without the biblical narrative, it just makes sense on like a very deep biological level. Our perception of the future or aka what's far in front of us, quite literally, not just the future, but literally what's in front of us is obscured by all the trees. So in like a metaphorical sense, you could say the forest represents a lot of obstacles that stand in between you and the light at the end of the tunnel or you and your clear future of prosperity. Like maybe there's a, a river at the end of the wilderness. Maybe there's a nice area to set up, you know, a civilization at the end of the forest. But when you're in the forest, you can only see what's right in front of you and there could be all sorts of obstacles that you're unaware of because mm -hmm. of that lack of visibility. So it's just on a very like basic visibility level, it makes sense that it's, it's a more stressful environment than like an open area where you can see far into the, like far into the distance. So. Right. Yeah. So it's so that, and it's just kind of like we're, we're ingrained in this. It's fraught with danger. You know, scary movies, horror flicks. They're always getting running, you know, chasing them around in a. They they never chase them out in the open, like a middle of a field, unless the field's got a bunch of obstructions like corn or something. Yeah, they're kind of, in the woods with the chainsaws after whatever. So, um, woods are scary. Add nighttime to it, it takes the fear level up. And I'm glad that we're filming this in the daylight. <laughs> I'm gonna start get the get the willies. Yeah, being lost in the woods is a fearful thing. If you've ever been anybody who's ever been lost in the woods knows that feeling of panic when you don't know where you are and you don't know the way out put a nighttime component into that and it goes up even higher uh there's a supernatural fact and this is a supernatural fact that fear it's kind of like when there's blood in the water sharks smell it and they come from miles away demons will smell your fear and they will come from miles away to see if they can exploit that fear for their nefarious purpose. Mm. Yeah. And then see, that's why the Bible tells us, Hey, you got the Holy spirit in you. You do not have a spirit of fear. There's a reason why uh, fear is mentioned so many times in the new Testament, because it is, it is driving home a point that fear will leave you in your tracks, but fear will summons. It's kind of like a scent that they will come, even if they're not on to you right now, you know, that they smell it, they're going to come and they're going to look and they're going to see what they can do. Yeah. Just, All right. I just, I want to pause on that for one second I, to the, to the critics watching the show. I, I think there's a lot of people who feel, especially nowadays, I've heard it so much like 
following the science and, you know, we're all about facts, like empirical evidence of things. And that's why people can't believe in God is because they can't see God. They can't measure God. They can't prove God. And I find that in real life, not in intellectual land where you can kind of go anywhere you want, in real life, there's facts and then there's truths. Often those align. And frankly, you know, the ultimate truth, which is God and his narrative that he very eloquently described through the Bible, all the facts usually align with that truth because it's, it's just true. But the interesting thing is when you said a supernatural tr- uh, supernatural fact, that almost sounded like a funny juxtaposition at first. I'm like, wait a second, supernatural, which is unprovable, unknowable, essentially kind of a nebulous thing, even though it's very real and very true, but you use the word fact. So supernatural fact, I like that because that is the kind of fact that is much more important than the fact that gravity has X uh, Im- impact on a object moving through space, all those facts that are technically factual have less bearing on our life than the supernatural facts, that, like what you're talking about. So, I mean, this is arguably more important than empirical evidence. Like, yeah, it's a supernatural fact. You just know that it's true, that fear is like this tangible thing, and these the spiritual realm is seemingly very aware of that, and they the exploit that. The spiritual realm will exploit fear every time. I'm not saying they're going to possess you, but they can use that fear uh, to to bring about what what their mission is in that area at that time. It's like an open door when they see that. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. It is absolutely an open door. Now, evil and evil spirits exist everywhere. That's a data point that you can't factor out. Um, they're everywhere. Cities, woods, space, water, wherever. But I want to ask you this, because this is a data point. Why does it? that Stonehenge, any hinge, whether it's a stone hinge, not just a main stone hinge, but any hinge, uh, any place that has altars built for the black arts, witchcraft, why is it always out in a wooded area? On a practical level, it's not, I would say that kind of, behavior is probably not as mainstream to Mm. just put it right in the middle of a city. Right. So So they go out to somewhere remote, maybe cities and neighborhoods and villages. People see it. It's, it's counterculture. You don't want to do it. Yeah. Uh, but I want to add this to it. Extra power can be given to the, to the, could it be that extra power is given to, Nephilim, fallen angels, demons, when they're out away from the urban environment where more eyes can be cast on them. Uh, also, this is a this is another supernatural fact that if blood is used at these sites, whether it's a Stonehenge, whether it's a whatever altar built, whatever. If a if blood is sacrificed in any form from an animal or a human, that spot right there is what's called a blood curse, and there will always be more powerful evil entities in that area because of the spilt blood. Mm. And you know that that took place at Stonehenge and these other places throughout the ages. So there is a definite stronger presence of evil in those areas, in those wooded areas where that takes place. Uh, whenever whenever blood is spilled at, at these places, it takes the evil to a, a much higher, higher level. Uh, so that's what's called a blood curse. So we believe that two things can be true at once, right? So if an altar is set up in the woods and a blood curse takes place and that ground is pretty much... Uh, powered up for evil then the same thing would happen in an urban environment so you can't just factor it out so if somebody takes a room starts to do sacrifices in it or builds an altar to summons demons there's going to be more power in that room than outside of that room so that alone can't be it so could it be logan that the seclusion of the woods being alone out in the woods uh Fear and seclusion actually powers up demons that are around to come and bother you and to and to manifest themselves. Another interesting data point that I wanna I wanna mention is 
people call it folklore, but I believe that you can tie fairies and gnomes and that sort of thing back to Nephilim as a shape shifting. And if that's the case, where do they always take place at? Always in the woods. Always in the woods. Uh, folklore is filled with stuff like that. And some of it I can't square with uh, shape shifting Nephilim. Some of it you can. So I guess you'd say this. Here's a fact. Evil spirits shape shift according to their environment and the fears and the thoughts of the person that they're going to manifest to. Yeah, that, that sounds perfectly reasonable to me. Yeah. All right. So the best answer I can give for this question to boil it down with all the data points and see if you kind of agree with this. Woods, it is entire as is, is, is can can woods be more powerful? Or can evil spirits be more powerful in the woods? It is entirely dependent on the circumstances, the individuals, and the environment. Yeah, and to me, like you've already described, that environment is perfectly conducive to that, to the opening the door with fear, with the unknown, with the obstacles in your way of perceiving what's what's you know far off in the distance. You can't see in the distance. You can't see what's even behind the trees and just right in front of you. So I think that creates... And like you said, when you add darkness to that, there's so many layers of vulnerability. I think demons who are innately just these predatory creatures, of course they're going to go where there's the most there's the most opportunity to catch someone fearful, lost, unsure of where they're going. All those variables can play into the the weakness and the ability to, you know, be vulnerable and weak in that scenario. I, yeah. Right. Now, if the question if the question was this can evil entities and spirits be more powerful in the dark than in the daylight? The answer is 100% yes. Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. for the same reason. Yeah. Def- is 100% definite. But you have to have uh, environment, environmental issues, the individual, that sort of stuff is going to come into play when it comes to a geographical location, whether it's in the woods or it's in a room or it's in a city. Yep. So um, I think the better way to, to sum it up would be this. Demonic entities are powerful, all right? But we as humans play into their power. We give them the ability to power up, and we give them the ability to power down. And so that's what people have to keep in mind. If anything ever were to shape shift in front of you, you don't. if you're a believer in God, you don't have to fear it. All right, Logan, next question that's up for consideration is what is our take or do we have any opinion or do we even know that all these people are missing in national parks uh, did you ever know that that this is this wild number i've seen that there's documentaries about that general topic um just the the mysteries of national parks but i don't really know any hard hard data on on missing people all right so the numbers are really high, and I guess you'd say the person who really started this is a project called the 411 Project. It's 411, and then it's books, and there's some documentaries and some movies. And a guy named David uh, Pilates uh, is the one who started um, the research on this. And the reason why I started cluing in on him versus some other people is, A, he is the one who has the biggest resource, the most resources to investigate this. And he has a huge team, and he is a former San Jose police officer. Hmm. And when he was a San Jose police department, you know, when he worked there, he was, you know, worked uniform patrol like everybody coming up through the ranks. But he worked on the SWAT team. He worked street crime. He did some investigation. Uh, now he is a private investigator and an author. And he, your 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 wife would like find this interesting. He his first writings and his first investigation. Uh, was really into trying to prove Bigfoot real. <laughs> yeah. My wife's family loves the whole Bigfoot. Okay. Yeah. And, and so they really need to read his books on that because he does a fabulous job on showing that they're pretty much real, you know. And so okay. uh, he doesn't call The one thing that he will never do, we're going to take some liberties with, he will never do, he will never say this has a supernatural element to it. This has a right. supernatural yeah. element to it, which I'm going to, I can, I'm going to say that. Um, what he has proven with the Bigfoot, the Sasquatch, you can easily tie back to a Nephilim. Yeah. yeah. And so um, he was studying and he was researching Nephilim, uh, not Nephilim, but the Bigfoot when he 
stumbled across all these people missing in National Forest. Uh, in fact, he was approached by a few park rangers. And there, Now, I'm going to say some things that are critical of the park police, just from a law enforcement back, background, because they are funded well, highly trained. Uh, there's no reason in the world why their reporting system is so antiquated and so convoluted. But then again, when the federal government has its hand on something, that should be expected. Yep. Uh, is there a, my, my, my first instinct is what are they covering up? Are they, are they, are they keeping their record? Are they, are they, are they doing such a horrible job or keeping this antiquated record system in place to, uh, aid in the cover up of all these missing people? Because, you know, if you, when we look at some of the numbers, if you were planning a trip to a national forest, you're probably good next time with the machine gun, Yep. you know, because, uh, it, it, it's crazy. So. What if I told you that thousands of people miss, uh, go missing every year from from just the natural the, uh, the the national parks in the United States, a huge number from Canada, and really he, he's expanded and took this all around the world to the to each country's national park, and there is a statistical anomaly that doesn't square. Now. The exact number we don't know because the reporting system that the National Park Service uses. But let me give you some statistics um, that, 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 that are out there that we can put our hands on, and they're probably low numbers. And I want to say this before we get into it, the people who may be naysayers on this, yes, I do understand. The woods and people aren't, you know, Grizzly Adams aren't used to being in the woods, so you can go out and you can venture too close to a cliff and fall off and die. Yeah. You can get out there and get in over your head. Your cell phone doesn't work. You don't really know you don't know how to use a map and a compass, and you get lost and you die from the elements. An animal like these she bears that we read about in Kings decides to have you for snack. A snake bites you. Factor all that in. And some people just go into the national park to commit suicide. All right. And you got some people that are in there probably have been murdered because people, you know, I don't, you know, there could be some murders in there, but there's nothing that would track to like serial killer or anything like that. You factor all that into it and you still have what I believe and what most people who really look at it objectively say is that is high numbers of missing people compared to going missing just throughout a normal day. Yosemite Park. 40 people go missing every year in Yosemite Park. But there was a spike in that between 2018 and 2020. In those years, right around 740 people went missing just in those years alone. A period of those years. Okay, I was about to say, no way that happened in one year. What the? Okay. Okay. But this is what the numbers come down to. One out of every 100,000 visitors to Yosemite Park go missing. That's a lot. Yeah, you would. That's <laughs> yeah. That's actually a lot. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So, Grand Canyon National Park. Uh, just since 2018, 62 people have been missing or found dead that they know of. You know, could be more, could be less. Um, that is 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 high when you look at it, but it's not it's not as mind boggling as Yosemite. The national parks in California. Uh, in the past 10 years, over about 1,800 people have gone missing. Uh, you, you have about 150 people a year, 2.8 people a week go missing in the national parks in California. That's, that's alarming. Now, this is the one that I think we're going to have to spend an entire episode on. And it's called the Alaska Triangle. It stretches from Juneau to Anchorage to Barrow. Uh, Alaska, boom, boom, boom. In the middle of that is what's called the, the Denali National Forest. Over 20,000 people have vanished since 1988. That's three times the national average for missing people. Now, I know Alaska's rough. Here's another one. In this Alaska Triangle, more UAPs, or we call them UFOs, are sighted more. There's... Of the UFO sighted in this triangle, there's more sighted in there than all around the United States or the world in any given year. 
You've had two congressmen go missing from an airplane, just went off the radar in the 60s there, just gone, just flying through it and gone. Nobody knows where they went. Plane crash, maybe, I don't know, but they could never find the wreckage. And one of them was the Speaker of the House, so you know it was an extensive search. This is, this is what's going to blow your mind when I say Sasquatches are documented to have destroyed. A, there is a ghost town on the shores of a river, and it's a ghost town simply because Sasquatches went in there and raised havoc. Oh, my gosh. And it's, it's documented. Sasquatch, they left because of Sasquatches. <laughs> okay. Within the, within the triangle here in Alaska, there is some electro, uh, elect, uh, electromagnetic, elect, yeah, electromagnetic. electromagnetic activity that is the same that takes place at the pyramid, the same that takes place in the Bermuda Triangle, and the same that takes place, what we believe with the Nephilim earthworks that we've studied. You have GPSs don't work in these areas. Your compass will read, it'll read, this way, it'll read that way. It, every five minutes, it changes north, and this 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 hurts uh, rescue attempts. Mm. But they're situated not just one. There's many of these within the triangle. You're a runner, okay? There's a race. We're gonna we're gonna look at this case that happened in there. There's a race that they run in this area. It's a one of those extreme races where you're running, but you're going up and down mountains and all that. And they, you wear your bibs and you have a little tracking device. So you, you can't cheat. Dude just disappeared. Just gone. You know, he's watching them on the computer and they just watch his little dot disappear. So they go, they send somebody out immediately because this is well monitored to find them to see if he fell down, see what happened. And there's no trace of them anywhere. Not a, not not a not a shoestring, not a not a water bottle, nothing, just gone, ghosted, never to be found. So I think that I think that the Alaska one, there's so much there that we probably need to take a whole episode. What do you think? Yeah, definitely. That sounds like yeah. That, there's got to be a, there's got to be documentaries on that, right? Though, surely, sure. There's there's yeah, some, there's there some documentaries out there. Um, what I did is look at some of the documentaries. I started pulling reports. I started going and looking at some other stuff. So. We'll have some stuff in there. Uh, yeah, we'll have some stuff in there on that that, that maybe hasn't been put in a documentary yet because we're still pulling some stuff. But I think that it's very compelling. I mean, if you go look at it, go just go Google the devil, not the devil's triangle, the Alaska triangle. And the whole Sasquatch thing, I'm really wanting to get their police reports. I'm trying to get a hold of the actual police reports from the Alaska State Police. Mm. To have yeah, a copy. Because if that happened, there certainly should have been some level of so there, documentation. There, there's on documented that. that they that the police reported it, and and so there should be a, a, a on file somewhere. I want to get that so we can hold it up and go. There's the police report. I like to read it. You know, um, that's probably wishful thinking with that sort of scenario. I'm sure they've got that. Just like you said with the, the oh, covering up it. of stats. Yeah. Oh, it got lost in a boating accident. Um. So let's start with the national park closest to us, which would be the Smoky Mountain National Park. You've been there? Oh, yeah, all the time. All the time. According to the National Park Service, the Great Smoky Mountain National Park draws about 10 to 12 million people every year, making it the most popular national park within the national park system. Now, the ABC affiliate, WATE, out of, as Channel 6 out of Knoxville, Tennessee, reports this. Uh, 400 people go missing in the Smoky Mountains each and every year. Now, here's the number. That's five out of every 100,000 people that visit. That is a lot, a lot. Holy cow. All right, so like all disappearances within a national park, you can't exclude vanishing for foul play, suicide, animals, accidents, but five out of every 100,000, at least one and a half to two of those aren't because of foul play, accidental death. There's something going on. Uh, take high, There's a high school teacher named uh, Lynn Gibson. Now He went missing all the way back in 1976. Hiked that trail. 
two, three times, four times, five times a month. It was the same thing every time, just missing without a trace. Uh, you can rule out suicide. There's no suicide note, no no evidence of that type of behavior or signs. And no people, your skeptic will say, when well, people don't know, you know, they don't sit there and telegraph it. Yeah, they do if you really look. If you really start to look back after someone kills themselves, you can go back in time and say, yeah, I missed that, I missed that. There's nothing there. Everything was going great with this guy. Uh, same thing with somebody who, uh, another female uh, who used to hike the very same trail. Uh, years later in that 1981, same thing, went in, checked in with the ranger, said, I'll be coming out at this time. Nothing, just gone. You know, you just have all these people that are missing. But the one that I want to bring up to you is this. Dennis Martin went missing a long time ago, in June 14, 1969. Uh, he was a boy out there with his family. They were out there camping. And some other families came into this little field area, open field area within the woods. And the kids started playing. They were playing hide and seek. And the kid went to hide behind a big tree. The little girl, one of the little girls said he went behind that tree, went behind that tree to never be seen again. Now, this is what's strange. You know, this goes on a week long. The father refused to leave goes on and on, but then all of a sudden, the United States Special Forces fly helicopters in and start searching the wooded area, which, unless you're well-connected, uh, and this guy was not well-connected to the U.S. government, nor was he well-connected to the United States Army, the United States Army's regular soldiers are not going to come in. That's more of a National Guard thing. So when some of the reporters went and asked the uh, sergeant major with the with the special forces, what are you guys doing here? He was just like, can't tell you. Are you here to search for the boy? Can't tell you. But witnesses say that they started their grid search right at that tree and started working their way into the woods. Now, that's just a little bit weird. That's suspect to not have an explanation. And like you said, that's that's there's a very clear protocol, and it seemed like, that was overkill, and they couldn't say why. No, and the FBI agent that was assigned to it, um, they were assigned to it because ordinarily your FBI is not going to come into a local matter on a missing person. They'll come in on a kidnapping, but they're not going to come in. And this guy worked um, the case from pillar to post, couldn't come up with anything, uh, at, I'm not mistaken. I have to go back and look at the notes. Somebody killed themselves out over this, one of the family members or one of the law enforcement officers, and there's always been questions why. But 50 years, 60 years after the fact, this kid's still not around. You know, no, no sign of him, not so much as a hair, tennis shoe, nothing. Nothing. There's just this kid went missing without a trace. He ran. Think about it. He runs behind a tree playing hide and go seek. They count to 20, one, two, three, four, whatever. And you know, no, nobody counts to 20. You, you, one, two, three, five, six, seven, 20. Boom. And they take off running. And the girl saw him hiding, so she's going to go get him. She's there within three to five minutes, and he's ghosted. That's just not enough time to go Missing. insanely far if you're a small child. I mean, that just doesn't make any sense. Well, the parents realized. So the, the kids start yelling for little, you know, Dennis to come back or whatever. And the parents realize what's going on. They got on the, they got on the trail pretty quick. Now there's, when you, if you go and you Google this and you research it, you'll see some witnesses say they saw the kid being carried by a guy. Some people say they saw the kid being carried by maybe a Sasquatch, but you know what? I don't put really validity into those at all. I think those are people who just happened to be there, heard the story and come up with something for whatever reason people do that. I don't know, but that one, that one, is uh, bizarre. Now, this is what I want to tell you. Over 90% of the missing cases, of all the missing cases that are reported, whether it's nice like it is today, sunny, blue skies, person goes missing, within an hour a storm pops up or rain happens. Almost every single time. Really? 
That's an anomaly. Yeah, we got to come back with the numbers on that. That'd be interesting. That'd be that, a whole separate like, that, data point. That is that is an anomaly within the missing person things that got my attention to say there is something here. Hmm. Okay. Now, this Pilates guy, as I'm researching this stuff, because I didn't really know much about it, so I'm reading and I'm, I'm looking and uh, said that he, he has learned, he has discovered that because he was he was posed a question um, at a forum one time. Well, do you have any anomalies like this within an urban environment? And he says, I don't don't check it, haven't seen it. Whatever his answer was, but he started to he said well, that's probably worth looking into. And he did find some anomalies within an urban environment. And let me tell you what the anomalies are, because I think this one deserves an episode to itself because I'm intrigued because something just happened that fits all these data points, okay? Um, in an urban environment, he has seen a spike in healthy white males between the age of 20 and 25. They're either in college, they're in grad school, or they have just recently graduated college within a year. They go missing in an urban environment near water, a river, or a lake, or an ocean. Uh, they are later found within seven to eight days in that river, lake, or body of water. No blunt force trauma, no signs of a struggle. Very few uh, uh, on the death certificate say drowning. It says undetermined, cause of death undetermined. Here's another one. He said, "Well, these are all weird data points. You know, these are all these are these. This isn't this isn't a coincidence. This isn't a fluke." So he said, "I'm just going to check, see what I can find out on their an, you know ancestry.com, whatever. Like nine out of ten of them are from Germanic descent. You know, so that that could just be a fluke in the in the DNA, or is there something there? But these are data points in." He has other data points that I don't that maybe aren't as compelling, but these are the data points to me. I look at and I say these are compelling. You know, I, they're they're there across the board on all of them. So right after I stumbled onto this, you I don't know you don't watch the news that much or read the news. I don't think, but uh, have you heard of this kid named Riley Strain, the 22 year old that went missing in Nashville a few weeks ago? He went missing uh, on March 8th in nashville they have him the last known footage if they got some other footage but the footage that they have out there for everyone to see is him walking by waving at a police officer who was working some burglars yes. uh, car, car break-ins he was working yep. some car break-ins well they find his body eight miles from where he waved at that cop dead in the cumberland river kids in a fraternity in nashville for a spring formal Blonde-haired, blue-eyed, healthy, white college kid fits all the data points. This this one will be in those data points for Pilates without a doubt because all those are there. Um, what could be causing these things? I believe it's tied to the paranormal. Now, as we unpack this moving forward, I have found... Um, I had printed off uh, uh, President Eisenhower's itinerary for the day that he supposedly met with the Greys and signed a treaty that they could do this sort of thing. Okay, now supposedly he chipped his tooth and went to the dentist. Okay, but the Washington Post one of, or one of the one of the papers from Washington reported, and then they had to quickly retract it that he died of a heart attack. Um, but there is definitely so you can see how it goes down. Also, I printed off um, from some archive files from his from his library from you know the National Archives that show. He's the one president that spent more time dealing with UFOs, or UAPs, whatever they call them now, than any other president that's, that's documented. His granddaughter, 
says that he died on his deathbed saying that he signed two treaties, one with the Nord Nordic aliens, and the Nordic aliens look like tall, kind of blonde-haired, no lips, all white, but they're taller. First, for them to be able to look at natural resources and take natural resources not to cause problems. The second was with the Greys, and that's the one here in the 50s that I'm talking about where he went missing um, for his supposedly chipped tooth on a chicken wing uh, that he was eating at his meal. And got, he was on vacation in California when all this happened. He, um, the granddaughter says that he told them he signed a treaty with the Greys to be able to abduct humans, to abduct cattle, uh, to do experiments, but he specifically said you cannot kill them in the treaty. They signed the treaty, and then several years later, you start seeing their first reports of cattle mutilations. You find your first report, and then it got really big in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. You start seeing that there's reports of them. You start to see a high number of alien, or you could say UAPs, UFO sightings, almost within a short time frame after he chipped his tooth and went and got it fixed. Big One of the big conspiracy theories out there. Did he really do that or not? I don't know, but we're going to throw it in there for food for thought because it could be the reason why we see people missing from our national parks. It's government-owned land. Some of these people show up alive, and we're going to look at some of their documented cases. When they show up alive, they show up 8, 10 miles away. They're hungry, but they have no trauma. They don't have any. You, do, you would never know that they were out in the exposure the way they would be for eight or nine days, but they have don't know where they are. And we can almost attribute that to brain fog. That's proven with those types of encounters, the Nephilim type. We don't believe in aliens, so to speak. When I say aliens, different framing of the same, thing. you know that I'm talking about extra dimensional beings. They were taken to an extra dimension. I don't know if that's the case, but we're working hard to try to prove that. So what say you, I say, I'm very interested in this whole thing. And this feels very, biblical x files it just feels very on brand and it's to me something i could go on and on about and just hear you especially with these these stats and figures i know it's like not as exciting as you know footage and whatever but honestly the numbers and some of these weird reportings that you have and that you're going to continue to gain access to that's just as shocking to me because the fact that there are actual clear data points of these things happening in like a pattern where we can observe that you could talk all day long about doctored footage, but when there's stats that were that were developed with no bias towards some kind of supernatural narrative, and it just so happens that it's this like very well documented, you know, verified sources that don't have any dog in that fight, that's when it really starts to make sense. And we'll make sure in that one that we put up the slides of the of the actual diary itinerary of the president at that time so you can see it right there from yeah i'm very excited to get from into the, from that. the archives yep. yeah so that's what we're going to be our next few episodes we're going to unpack this and dig into it really biblical x-file style well i'm looking forward to it man all right brother see you then